appreciate so much the uh, song we were let in, the prayer. Uh, one thing I didn't tell Ronald at that table, we were eating at Helen's tonight, and I think that Ronald and Sean, uh, I, I appreciate the wonderful meal, and that is good food down there. And I wonder sometimes if they take me out to eat before I speak because they think I'm not going to speak as long. But Ronald did say, if you heard him, something like, Eric, preach as long as you want to. Oh, my wife didn't need to hear that. You know, one thing I didn't also, I didn't tell my wife, Ronald, that I was gone 110 days last year. So I was doing my, no, that's okay. Uh, she, now, she knows now. I was doing my taxes a week or two ago and figuring up, you know, how many miles you've driven and stuff. And I realized I was gone a little more than I thought I was last year. Uh, probably won't be gone as much <laughs> this year. That's okay. I'm, I'm so blessed to be here with you all and doubly blessed that Jana could be, uh, could be with me to talk about things that I love to get to talk about. I hope that the, uh, the words on the screen will uh, cooperate with you know, my computer and y'all's computer. And if it doesn't, please forgive me. Sometimes in the translation from one to another, there are some issues I'm not the best speller in the world. In fact, Jana is a better speller and probably a better writer, but for some reason I'm the writer in the family. Uh, but, you know, if you see an issue with one or more of the slides, know that I'll take all the blame for it. You know, if someone came up to you and said, why do you believe, why do you believe in Jesus? Why do you believe that Jesus Christ is who he claimed to be? And who he claimed to be was God in the flesh. When the Bible calls him the Son of God, that doesn't mean that he was like literally born of the Father. That, that's not what the, the idea behind that is. He is of the nature of God. He is man. He was man, is man. He is, was, and always will, and always has been God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Jesus Christ is deity. We live in a day and time when a lot more people are questioning these kinds of things. And so I was, I was uh, very happy when I was asked about coming back and speaking along these lines about these things. And I'm excited to hear that I believe this congregation will be doing a study in VBS on Jesus and using some of the AP, the Apologetics Press material about the name of Jesus, where you'll get into a lot of the things, some of the things that we are studying this weekend together, probably even you'll get into it on a deeper level. But if someone said, hey, why do you believe in Jesus? You know, it, it would be appropriate to say, well, I believe there is a God, and I believe that the Bible is the Word of God, and thus I believe what the Bible says about, about Jesus, and that would be appropriate. And what does the Bible say about Jesus? Well, what we studied last night was one, one of literally hundreds of Old Testament prophecies about Jesus. I mean, I know we use some New Testament passages as we went to John 7 and Matthew chapter 2 and some other New Testament passages, but the, the, the main thrust of it was that Micah had said 700 years before Jesus ever came to earth that he would be born, that the Messiah would be born, not in Jerusalem, not in Hebron, not in Jericho, not in Dan, not in Beersheba, but in the little town of Bethlehem. And one of the reasons that we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and He is the Savior of mankind and He is the Creator of the world, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit all had a hand in creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God hovered or moved upon the face of the waters. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And so the Bible tells us that God and God, the Word, the Son, He created. He is our creator. He is our sustainer. Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Uh, we are held together in Him, by Him, and through Him, both physically and spiritually. By the way, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 tells us that He upholds, and verse 3, that He upholds all things with the Word of His power that He upholds the universe by the word of His power. I believe that Jesus is different than anyone else who's ever walked this planet because before He ever walked this planet, as we discussed last night, His life was recorded for us, which is mind-boggling, supernatural, miraculous, which brings us to our second point and our theme for this lesson, 
or our topic for this lesson, and that is that we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God because He worked miracles to prove what He said about Himself. That He is the virgin-born, heaven-sent, miracle-working, perfect, perfectly holy, sacrificial, and resurrected from the dead Son of God, who ever lives to make intercession for us, as the Hebrews writer says. But some might say, well, Eric, you know, I, I, don't, I don't believe in miracles. You know, I don't, you know, if you talk to some today, they would say, well, Eric, I can't believe that Jesus is the Son of God because of the miracles that He worked, because I don't believe that He worked miracles, because I don't believe that there are miracles or that there ever were miracles. And think about that for just a moment. Let's say you're talking to an atheist or an agnostic, one who you know, doubts whether there is a God or at least hasn't seen the evidence, they say, for God, and so they don't believe in Him or at least you know, they, they don't necessarily deny Him. They just don't say that you know, He does exist. They, they say we can't know that for sure. Or maybe they're just skeptics. But you know, if some don't believe in miracles, well, they, they don't believe in miracles probably because they, they haven't come to believe that God exists. In fact, Carl Sagan said the cosmos is all that is or ever was or ever will be in 1980. He was a, some of you recognize the name, a well-known atheist from uh, uh, the 1900s, late 1900s. And so some deny the miracles of Jesus because they, because they deny that there is a supernatural, that there is a God. And so they deny the supernatural God and they deny supernatural miracles. Others, well, they they just don't believe that the Bible is the Word of God, and so they disbelieve what the Bible says, period. Let me just stop right here and say this. It's interesting, is it not, that um, you know some may say they, they deny miracles, and whether they say it or not, it may have a lot to do with the, whether or not they believe in God. And yet, those same people would say that, I mean, many leading atheists today say that A big bang happened some 14 billion years ago, and it came from nothing. I mean, like Richard Dawkins is on record saying that. Dan Barker, who's one of the more well-known atheists in America, is on record saying that. Um, uh, Let's see, Dr. Stephen Hawking was on national television uh, a few years ago saying that before he passed away, that, that nothing caused the big bang. So, I mean, think about that. You know, they they would... They have come to the conclusion that nothing could cause everything, but they're going to deny that God exists. Or they've come to the conclusion that you could have life, like self-replicating complex life, whether in the form of a worm, a fish, a reptile, or a a human being, and they would say, well, ultimately that came from non-life. And yet no one has ever seen nothing give give way to a universe, and they've never seen non-life give way to life. Do you know what atheists believe? With all due respect, they believe in things they've never seen. They have a blind faith. And they accuse Christians oftentimes of having a blind faith. So I just wanted to, to stop here for a moment at the very beginning and say, hey, there are some who would say, well, Eric, I don't believe in the miracles of Christ because I don't believe in God or don't believe that the Bible is the Word of God. It, it should be by the way, as, we talk, as we've talked about before, there are a number of evidences for the Bible's inspiration. In fact, I think there's a book in the back called Behold the Word of God. It's, it's a great book that my colleague Kyle Butt wrote a few years ago. And listen, if you can't afford any of those materials in the back, uh, feel free to, to take those. We'll take any of those monies out of Jana's paycheck. And uh, she would rather you have them than not get them. We never want money to stand between people and good uh, Bible material. Also, this material is virtually all free in digital form on our website or on our app. So feel free to to look and you can search and find articles or videos on these kinds of things. But if you were to ask me, Eric, well, why do you believe that the Bible is the Word of God? And I I would contend that there are fascinating evidences, some of which we, we looked at last night. Just a prophecy about someone who's going to be born 700 years later that came about just as the Bible said that it would. But I believe that you could summarize and that the all-encompassing reason that someone should come to believe that the Bible is the Word of God is because to err is human. 
but the Bible writers got everything correct about the past, about the present time in which the Bible writers were living, and even about the future, which is what we were talking in part about last night. But it should be no surprise that some today will never believe that Jesus' miracles proved His deity. Je Jesus laid His hands on a few sick people in Nazareth where He grew up and, and healed them, and He marveled because of their unbelief. You recall when He had healed someone who was possessed by demons and his enemy said they didn't deny that he had worked a miracle. They just said they attributed the miracle that he worked to Beelzebub, to uh, evil uh, spirits and Satan himself. By the ruler of demons, you cast out demons. Notice they didn't say, well, you didn't, you didn't work a Real miracle. In John chapter 11, you can read where Jesus raised a man who had been dead for four days. And you know what the Pharisees sought to do? Poor Lazarus. He died. He rose from the dead by the power of God. Jesus proving with such miracles that he was who he claimed to be. Heaven sent. Savior of the world. And Lazarus rose at the command of Jesus. Lazarus come forth. And the enemies of Jesus sought to kill him again. Read John chapter 12, verses 9 to 11. But notice the, the implication of these passages is that even, you know, even though today we, we get frustrated when people don't believe, we'll realize that people who actually saw Jesus walk this earth in the flesh and saw the miracles that he worked, well, they... They rejected Jesus then. So it, it pains us. It, is, it saddens us greatly when people reject Jesus today. But there is a sense in which we should not be surprised because they rejected Him 2,000 years ago. You know, there, there is a real relationship that we need to, to recall here at the beginning of our lesson, you say, at the beginning, you're already 10 minutes into this, man. What are you talking about at the beginning? Well, okay, we're getting into the meat of this now. There's a, there's a great relationship between revelation, God revealing things to uh, humankind, and confirmation. For example, in Exodus chapter, uh, chapter 4, you can read that Moses was going to go before Pharaoh. And Moses was like, well, what if Pharaoh doesn't believe me? And what did God do? Well, he offered evidence. What did he say? Throw down your staff and your staff would become a what? A snake. Pick it back up and it was going to become a staff again. Uh, put your hand in your chest and it's going to become leprous. Put it back in your chest and it's going to become a healthy hand again. Take water out of the river, it's going to turn into blood. He offered evidence when the apostles were sent out on the Great Commission. They were accompanied with signs, with miracles that were offered as proof. Sometimes we forget today and sometimes maybe we're raised being enamored with some of the biblical miracles and we think, wow, you know, that's just, that's neat. But they had a purpose they had a purpose. It, it, the, the, the purpose of miracles was not just, well, those lucky guys, you know, Peter and any of those guys ever got sick, they, just, they could just, you know, heal themselves, right? Have you ever read about Paul? Have you ever read 2 Corinthians chapter 11 to see all the adversities that he went through? Have you read 2 Corinthians chapter 12 about his thorn in the flesh? That's not, a, you know, a literal thorn, but some kind of... Uh, extreme difficulty likely you know some physical issue and he says he pleaded with the Lord three times and the Lord said my grace is sufficient for you my strength is made perfect in weakness my point is Paul couldn't just by the power of God just work a miracle on himself to cure himself unless God chose to do that and if God chose to do that it seems it would have been to confirm something, to confirm a message. That was the purpose of biblical miracles. A lot of people get the idea, well, well there are just miracles everywhere in the Bible. Well, there's a lot of miracles that are mentioned in the Bible, but the Bible, it's, it's not like it was produced to be some kind of 
uh, mere entertainment type movie. Oh, that's fascinating. Let me see what I can do. You know, if you and I had the kind of power that God had, can you imagine what we would be doing when we got frustrated with someone? Oh, my brother frustrated me. I'm going to zap you. I'm going to hang you up from the ceiling. I'm going to twirl you around. I'm going to throw you on the ground. You know, we would just be doing all sorts of just, just crazy things. That, that's, that's not what you see happening in Scripture. You know what, what everyone, I think virtually everyone admits, is that if there is a God and He ever decided to put on flesh and reveal Himself as God, that it is logical that He would have performed supernatural feats for the purpose of convincing His human creation that He is who He is claiming to be. I'm not saying that everyone believes in God or believes in the miracles that are mentioned in the Bible, but virtually everyone believes... Well, if there is a God, this, this does make sense. I mean, like, okay, prove to me you exist. I, I would contend that the miracle of creation that we see all around us today is proof of His existence. As the psalmist said, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows His handiwork. As Paul would say in Romans chapter 1, since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen by humankind, being understood by the things that that are made. You know, Jesus said in John chapter 10, this is an interesting passage to me. He's, he's, con, he, he's confronting his enemies. He's surrounded by his enemies. And he said, if I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Isn't it interesting that there's, there's a phrase in Scripture of Jesus saying, do not believe me. And he says, don't believe me if I don't give you the evidence which you deserve to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. The Gospel of John was written for the purpose of proving that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. And notice that John says, Truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of His disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written for this purpose. That's why they were worked. That's why they were written. And I, I, I would say, brothers and sisters, that I, I think that as we as Christians, and if we have any visiting non-Christians here tonight, we are so thankful that you are here. Uh, I know you, you are considered an honored guest, and I'm a guest this weekend, and I, I'm, I'm very honored to, to be here myself. As we think about and talk about miracles, we need to remember that we are living in a less and less believing time. I mean, there's unbelief all over the world, and there's always been un unbelief in existence. In our country's history, I don't know that it's ever been as low as it is today. And by unbelief, I'm talking about atheism, agnosticism, skepticism, just general unbelief, non-religious mentality. I posted a thing about our AP's VBS on, our, on, on my Facebook page the other day. I'm not... I don't do a lot of posting on social media, but every now and then I do. And I mentioned that there was a religious survey that was done by a nonprofit organization down in Florida, and the poll indicated that 52% of Americans claimed that Jesus was a good teacher, but not God. Another 12% said they didn't know. That's 64%. If that poll reflects... Our country today of 330 or so million people, 64% either say Jesus was a good teacher and not God or they don't know. Only 37% said that he was not only a good teacher but was or we believe that he was probably God. It matters who Jesus is. It matters what the evidence says. It matters because Jesus said in John chapter 8 and verse 24... If you do not believe that I am, you will die in your sins. 
Now, he's not saying in that passage that, that you know, just a mere mental assent is all you have to do to be saved. We're going to talk about that, Lord willing, tomorrow in the Bible class period about John 3.16. But that is fundamental to being saved. Coming to know who Jesus is and what the evidence says about Him and about His nature. So as we think about miracles in this day and time, let's be careful not to jump to, oh, there's not any miracles going on today like you read about in the Bible. Now, I believe that is a true statement regarding, hey, there, there are supernatural miracles that you read that Jesus did that people are not doing today. But here's the thing. People aren't doing them today because God can't do them, right? Right? We have to be careful that we don't leave the impression with people that we don't believe in a supernatural God who could work a supernatural miracle anytime He chose to, if He chose to. Why aren't there the kinds of miracles like the reattaching of severed ears, the healing of a withered hand, walking on water, etc. today? Well, number one, remember what the purpose of miracles were to confirm the Word. And number two... God just chooses not to do that today. And people may not like that, or they may not like that answer. But that doesn't mean that God's not doing things today. Is He upholding the universe with the word of His power? That's what the Hebrews writer says. Is He creating precious souls every time a child is, as I understand it, conceived? God's doing things, amazing things. Today, is he answering prayer? Is he working providentially in our lives like like he did in the lives of Joseph and Esther and many others throughout history? Well, I sure hope so. Oh, that we would be so honored to have our prayers answered and God working in our lives like he has worked in other people's lives. So let's just be careful when we talk about miracles that we don't you know, lead our unbelieving friends or our denominational uh, friends to believe things that the Bible doesn't teach. Let's just be balanced in the way and biblical in the way that we teach them. You recall that the disciples of John came to Jesus and they came asking Jesus what John wanted them to ask uh, ask Jesus. And, And that was... Are you the coming one? It's kind of hard for us to understand how John could ask this. John the the baptizer, the immerser. You know, maybe being in prison, he, you know, I don't know. I don't know what all his reasons were. But are you you the coming one or, or, or do we look for another? You know, John was about to be beheaded, you recall. And this is what Jesus said. He quoted from Isaiah, saying, Isaiah said, Behold, your God will come. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. Jesus said it this way, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Jesus was telling John, yeah, the Messiah has come. And the Messiah is doing exactly what the prophet, and we sometimes call him the messianic prophet, Isaiah said he was going to do. And he was working wonders for the purpose, not for the purpose, not for the purpose of simply releasing John the baptizer from prison. You know, God doesn't exist. And His purpose in this life, if Eric gets deathly sick, His purpose and my purpose is not just to get well. I mean, if I get well, to God be the glory. If I don't get well, to God be the glory. My purpose is to be here for whatever time I am allowed to be here to glorify God. And I know that that's easier said than done. I know it's easier said to have that mindset. But isn't that, shouldn't that be our our mindset? I don't know exactly what all was going through. The amazing John the the Baptist, or I, I 
I prefer to call him the immerser or the baptizer because it's not like his last name was Baptist. It was, it was what he did. He was an immerser. But he was no doubt struggling. Are you the Christ? Or do we look for another? And Jesus let him know that he is doing in God's own time, as Paul said, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, He came at just the right time to do just the right things that the Messiah was supposed to do. The Messiah was compassionate, but His miracles were not merely work to be compassionate. I suppose if so, He would have spent virtually all of His time doing that and not doing what? Preaching. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And He came, John chapter 4, the woman at the well to bring spiritual life and not simply physical healing, as nice as that was for so many people. I mean, if I was sick in the first century and I had heard about this amazing miracle worker, would I or would I want my wife or my kids or friends to go see Jesus? Yes, but there was a higher purpose for these miracles. Why do I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Because, in part, because of the miracles that He worked. Which is exactly what you would expect if God ever came to earth and put on flesh. Let's look at a few final reasons here why the miracles of Jesus are credible testimonies of His divine nature and teachers. Well, His teachings. Number one here, countless thousands witnessed the miracles. You know, when we talk about the miracles of Jesus, we're not just talking about, well, in some remote corner of the world, we heard that we maybe think this may have happened somewhere by someone. The miracles of Jesus, when He was at a wedding feast in Cana of Galilee, He worked an amazing miracle that a number of people would have seen, known, or heard about there. A hundred and roughly twenty gallons of water changed into this tasty beverage that Jesus made simply by willing it to happen. You can read where he went into a crowded house in Capernaum. He was already in it. There were people all around, the text tells us, who had come into this house. There was a lame man whose good friends brought him to the house. They couldn't get into the house, and you recall what they did. If you grew up in the church, hopefully you heard about this in Bible class, and hopefully some of our kids have heard about it. They had so much confidence and faith that Jesus could heal him that they began tearing the roof apart and letting him down through a hole in, in the roof. I mean, there were a crowd of people saw Jesus heal this man. Or... He would be in crowded synagogues and work amazing miracles. He healed the man at the pool of Bethesda where there was a great crowd. You recall, he fed 5,000 men. Uh, that's that's uh, the, the Greek word for men plus women and children. Several thousand people, more than just 5,000, with five loaves and two fish. Listen, I think I had more than two fish tonight, right? Ronald, you saw how many fish fillets there were on that plate. Jana got a little bit of it. I got, I, she was nice today. I gave her a little bit of my fish, and I ate a whole lot. It's a wonder I can even speak tonight, teach tonight, but we're trying. I mean, I just the, the Bible goes out of its way to tell us, hey, there's a lot of people who saw these things. You got questions about this? Go talk to them. How many people would have still been alive who had seen these miracles would still have been alive 20, 30, 40, 50 years later? There was another occasion, Matthew chapter 15, where he fed 4,000 men besides the women and children. And when Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost, he reminded them. This was a key fact in them seeing the evidence for Jesus. He reminded them that Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested, Attested. He he proved, he demonstrated who he was. How? By God to you, by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. He told these thousands of people on Pentecost, this is what you saw. And there were about 3,000 who responded on that occasion. The miracles of Christ, they are legitimate uh, 
evidence and, and, and their, their, their testimony of who Jesus is and ought to be believed because countless thousands witnessed them because even his enemies acknowledged them. Listen, when you can get your enemies to acknowledge something, I mean, that's, that's pretty powerful. I mean, let, let's just say that one of our young people's in school, and let's say the teacher knows that, you know, Johnny just has something against Billy. And Johnny just, he, he's for some reason never liked Billy, never been nice to Billy. And the teacher knows this. And the teacher thinks that maybe Billy has done something wrong. And Billy's like, I didn't do that. And Billy says, Johnny, did I do that? Now, for all of Johnny's faults, he's an honest boy. And he'll tell you he doesn't like Billy, but he's going to be honest about stuff. I'm not saying it's good to be mean, okay? I'm just saying... When the teacher asked Johnny, he's like, no, Billy did not do that. You know, that would, would that convince the teacher probably that, that, yeah, Billy didn't do what she may have thought he did? When your enemies can testify on your behalf, that's, that's powerful testimony. Well, following Lazarus' resurrection, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered a council and said, what shall we do for this man works many signs? They admitted it. They didn't like it. They didn't follow logically the, to follow it to its logical conclusion, but they admitted that he worked the miracles. Herod had desired for a long time to see him, Jesus, and he hoped to see some miracle done by him. And you recall, as we've already talked about from Matthew chapter 12, that Jesus, or the, the enemies of Jesus said, This fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. They got all that wrong. You recall, Jesus was like, Wait a minute, what sense does that make? Uh, as Satan cast out Satan, I mean, his kingdom is going to be destroyed. Eventually, right? That doesn't make any sense. Notice the implication of their statement is that Jesus worked a miracle. Jesus was scolded by a ruler of the synagogue who was rejecting Jesus because he was healing on the Sabbath day. There was a woman who was bound for 18 years with this infirmity and this hard-hearted Synagogue ruler, it's like he, he didn't deny the miracle, the amazing miracle that Jesus worked. He scolded him for doing it on the Sabbath day. Which that's just, there was nothing illegal about what Jesus did. There was nothing biblically wrong with what Jesus did. Jesus was like, do you, do you let your animals out to go drink water on the Sabbath day? And I release this woman of her bondage? of her pain, of her anguish, of her infirmity. These people, they were hard, hard. It's a lesson for us there to be careful. You know, a lot of times, brothers and sisters, you know, we live in a, a dark world. But you know, a lot of times where a lot of darkness comes from is religious people. You read your Bible. Who, who were some of the hardened most hardened people in Scripture. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Who were they? The religious leaders who supposedly knew the Bible better than anyone else, as we talked about last night. You remember the, some of those religious leaders? Oh, what prophet is ever going to come out of Galilee? Oh, well, they were wrong about that and wrong about Jesus. Now, there's some lessons here for us, but notice that even... Even the enemies of Jesus, they may not have liked him. They may not have liked what he, what he did, what he was doing. And they're probably jealous of him. But they didn't deny the miracles that he worked. In John chapter 9, there was a, an investigation into Jesus healing a blind man. I mean, they, his friends and others investigated to some extent. They took him to the rulers of the synagogue. They were investigating him. They called his parents in there, wanted to know, hey, is this really your son? They called him back in there again. You could just, it was almost like, I think of Larry, Moe, and Curly. Just, they were just doing their faces like this, like, wait a second, what's going on here? No, Jesus, there was a man who was born blind, and he made him see instantaneously. A miracle worked by Jesus. And the enemies of Jesus, they did a serious investigation of it and they could not disprove the miracle that Jesus worked. 
Even Nicodemus said in John 3, no one, no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And eventually you'll read in the book of Acts where a great many of the priests, they became believers. They became Christians. Priests that likely months and years earlier were denying Jesus. Thirdly, regarding the miracles of Christ, there were multiple writers who attested to them. I mean, think about it. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, they all attested to one or more miracles that Jesus worked, especially the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. The feeding of the 5,000, all of those witnesses, and this feeding is mentioned in all four gospel accounts. If this, if this was brought up in a court of law, Matthew, the former tax collector, would come and he would testify on behalf of who Jesus is and what he did there in the feeding of thousands of people. And Mark would. And Luke the physician would. And John the apostle would. I mean, that's, that's multiple individuals witnessing to what Jesus did. The accounts, by the way, are similar enough so as to not be contradictory, but varied enough so that one cannot reasonably conclude that the writers participated in collusion and just copied what each other wrote. Some people claim, well, there's, you know, it, it's almost like a no-win situation when it comes to the Bible writers for them because if, if what they wrote was too similar, then they say they copied off of each other, that is, Bible critics. If what they wrote is too dissim dissimilar, then they say, well, they, you know, they just contradicted each other. Well, there's... There are similarities and there's differences and it's really a beautiful thing because it's exactly what you would expect if they were independent writers. By the way, we have non-biblical sources like Josephus who said Jesus was a doer of wonderful works. Would this be maybe an unbeliever's way of saying Jesus worked some amazing miracles? Or how about the Jewish Babylonian Talmud or Talmud who indicated that this one who was hanged on the eve of Passover was one who practiced sorcery. Likely a, their attempt to talk about, in fact they call him Yeshu or Yeshua. Yashua, Joshua, which is the name for Jesus. Greek, Iesus, English, Jesus. Yeshu was hanged on the eve of Passover and they said this Yeshu, unbelievers, how would they refer to the miracles of Jesus? Maybe, oh yeah, he was a sorcerer kind of person. There's a number of individuals in the Bible and out of the Bible that attest in some way or form to Jesus. Furthermore, the Bible writers repeatedly noted how their purpose, it's not like they were, they were trying to write a Harry Potter series to get rich and famous. In fact, what they wrote, what they taught, what they preached got them killed. This was not a popularity contest for them. This was not getting rich and famous. This was life and death. And they risked their lives teaching not, not fairy tale stuff. They said over and over again that... They were, and they did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of His majesty. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. Or as John would say in 1 John 1 and, 1 and verse 3, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked upon, notice, which we have seen, looked upon, which, our hands have handled concerning the word of life, that which we have seen and heard with our ears, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. John was going out of his way to say, we've seen this, we've heard this, we've handled this. This is real. This, this, this is not an attempt for us to you know, just try to get famous by telling you crazy things. And by the way, when Paul talked about the resurrection of Jesus a few decades later, he said that there were over 500 people that saw Jesus rise from the dead, had seen Him after His resurrection. And he says that some have fallen asleep, but he says the greater part remain to the present. 
The greater part of 500 people were still around when Paul wrote this epistle. So if people wanted first-hand witnesses to it, they could find it. By the way, Henry S. Kerr said years ago about Jesus and the miracles that he worked in Biblica, uh, Bibliotheca Sacra, he said, We are not asked to believe in myths and legends of, of the kind of associated with paganism, nor in cunningly devised fables or old wives' tales. We are besought to accept sober stories of incidents which cannot be accounted for in any other way, save that God was directly and intimately at work in the matter. Fifthly, notice that Jesus signs his, his wonders, the miracles that he worked. They were very, it, it wasn't just that he had a little bit of, of power in one area. He had power in all areas. It, it, it was not limited to just a few things. His signs were many and varied. He showed power over affliction from everything from, from leprosy to healing the blind to reattaching a severed ear. He showed power over not only over affliction but over nature. He calmed the storm. He walked on water. He could make a fig tree wither away. He showed his power over demons. He healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, the Bible tells us. His power over the spirit realm and perhaps most fascinating, his power over death. Over death. The widow of Nain's son was in a casket already being carried down the street. He touches the casket, commands him to rise, and he, he lives again. Jairus' daughter, the ruler of the synagogue, Jesus raised her from the dead. Lazarus, whom we've already mentioned, Jesus had power over death. His signs were many and varied. And by the way, they weren't silly and overboard. I mentioned earlier that, you know, if you and I had the kind of power that Jesus had by the Holy Spirit, that we would, no doubt, we're just not as mature as Jesus was and is. And we would allow... Occasionally, our mistakes, our faults, our immaturity, our lack of long-suffering, etc., to get the better of us, and we would do all sorts of crazy things. But not Jesus. Furman Curley wrote years ago in Firm Foundation, he said, The gospel records are marked by restraint and sublimity in the description of miracles. They're not characterized by the sorcerer's hocus-pocus. Jesus didn't pull rabbits out of hats and simply to amuse people. He didn't turn his enemies into stones or set their robes on fire. There are few parallels to Jesus and magicians of the ancient world. And finally, his miracles are not being duplicated today. I mean, Jesus' miracles knew no limitations. He healed a severed ear with the touch of his hand. You know, this morning before Jana was up, I got up trying, trying to be a good husband, and it was dark, and I wasn't up very long, and I hit my little pinky toe on the corner of something, and it was all I could do to not yelp and wake her up. And the next thing I know, I've got blood coming out. I'll try not to be too gross. I, you know, my toenail is not what it used to be. I'll just say that. It, I, never, I, I started walking around and I was like, how can your little baby pinky toe have an effect on the way you walk? And I was walking around the room like, you know, like this. And, you know, if, if I could heal my toe, I, listen, I'd do it. But, you know, I can't and no one else can either. I did get a Band-Aid downstairs. That was, that was nice. But Jesus could instantaneously take an ear that was severed from a head without stitches and just put it back. The, the shriveled hand of one who was in the midst of Jesus' enemies, Jesus had the power to heal instantly. It would seem that any honest person would have to say that kind of miracle is not being duplicated 
today. He healed many of their blindness, including one man who had been born blind. He raised the dead simply by calling them out. And I've not seen the, seen the quote I've only heard that Marshall Keeble, well-known gospel preacher from over, I guess, 100 years ago or so, that he said, you know why he said Lazarus come forth, don't you? Because if he had just said come forth, then everybody would have started coming out of the graves. He could raise the dead simply by calling them out. The miracles of Jesus. I believe that they are credible testimonies to Jesus being better, greater, and His message being true, especially about who He was and is and what His purpose was. To seek and to save the lost. My hope and prayer is that we will make His confirmed purpose to be our purpose in this life. We've got jobs, we have families to take care of, we have work to do, but what's, what's our purpose? To go be with the miracle worker who worked miracles for the purpose of confirming the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the power of God to save to the Jew first and also to the Greek, to everyone God wants this message preached. He wants it taught to people in this community and around the world. It's been confirmed. It's in His Holy Word. And we have an opportunity to share it with other people in this community and, and around the world. Will you bow with me, please? Father, thank you for this period of study. We pray you will bless our study in the coming hour. Thank you for keeping us dry when it's wet outside. And thank you for a nice building like this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll take a break.